Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Shaw Theatre for the latest exciting instalment in the Irish Writers Weekend this Sunday afternoon. Um, my name is John. I look after the events programme at the library and the uh, festival is being presented in association with uh, the Kutch International Festival of Literature in Galway with the Sport Culture Island the Irish Embassy in London and the Doyle Collection Hotels. So uh, the next session, cheekily entitled Too Much Joyce, question um, mark, was, it was my cheeky attempt to think, to reflect the deliberations we had when programming the event, shall we talk about James Joyce? And given that it's his centenary year of Ulysses, we thought we'd give him one more chance to be talked about, and, and that's it. Uh, so uh, here we are, it's a fantastic panel. Uh, it's going to be hosted by Mia Levitin, who is a cultural critic and, and reviewer, who the um, Irish Times, Financial Times, Guardian and others, and um, also the author of The Future of Seduction. After the event, um, Anne and Nula will be over at the main building signing books as usual. So enjoy the session. <laughs> Hello, and thank you to everybody for being with us today, despite the football and despite last night's reception. Um, I'm delighted to be here today with our distinguished guests. Anne Enright needs no introduction, having been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award this week at the Irish Book Awards. Um, she's the author of seven novels, as well as a Sunday Times best-selling memoir um, about parenting called Making Babies. Um, as well as numerous short stories and, of course, all of her excellent um, pieces that you will have seen. She was the inaugural laureate for Irish fiction in 2015, um, and, and on top of her own um, amazing work, which includes the Booker winning The Gathering, she is a big promoter of other Irish writers, for which um, we're grateful. Nula O'Connor also won an Irish Book Award this week uh, for the best short story of the year for This Small Giddy Life. She is the author um, of Nora, which is an excellent historical uh, fictionalized biography of Nora Barnacle, uh, which I highly recommend you buy if you haven't. You'll be able to buy that after the session. Um, she's published four other novels as well as collections of short fiction and poetry. Um, and was also the curator of Love Says Bloom at the Molly earlier this year. Paul Muldoon, who's being beamed in from the States, um, is also a, a national treasure. He teaches at Princeton and is the author of 14 full-length collections of poetry, most recently Howdy Scalp in 2021, Frolic and Detour in 2019, and 1,000 Things Worth Knowing some of which we hope he'll share with us today. Um, his poetry has been awarded the T.S. Eliot Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, and the TLS called him the most significant English language poet born since the Second World War. But perhaps he prefers the Irish Post comparison to the Beatles, um, having edited Paul McCartney's books of lyrics. He's also, along with his wife, Jean Hanf Korlitz, the um, author and adapter of uh, The Dead, First Stage. So we'll be hearing more about that. So thank you to all of you for being here with us today. And uh, before we get into the crux of the debate as to whether or not we've had too much choice, especially after this year, um, I do think it's important that we recognize why it is that we're still talking about this um, novel 100 years on. Um, and Anne, you had written about how you um, discovered Ulysses at 14 and you compared it to mainlining drugs. You Language. Said, yes. <laughs> Mainly, I, hadn't, I haven't ever mainlined oh, any sorry. drugs. <laughs> so um, I want to make that clear <laughs> here. But you know that title, Too Much Joyce, uh, people said it to him at the time that too muchness is part of, his, uh, part of his mode, you know? So his brother said there was just too much of Ulysses. And then, of course, everyone thought there was too much of Finnegan's Wake. So everyone's been shouting too much, you know, for, 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 for over a century now uh, at Joyce. And uh, maximal, maximalizing is part of what he does. But yes, no, I, I bought my copy of Ulysses in Kinsale in the bookshop there in 1977 when I was 14. And I think I did it to attract young men. Um, I thought that carrying a, a 
book around while hosteling would make me look interesting and mysterious. Oh, I find it repels young men. I'm having mm -hmm. the opposite. It has the opposite effect for me. Oh, oh no, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, the only cosmetic surgery I need is a small frontal lobotomy. <laughs> and, and, and that would bring them in, I, I realised later in life yeah. but um <laughs> at 14 you were still hopeful but at 14 yeah, yeah. i still thought you yeah. know this was the way forward you know the, in the way that you'd stand in front of a painting in a gallery feeling that the next part, anyway it, di it didn't really work but i did read at least uh, I, I, not all the book at 14 but i read i'd say three or four sections uh, uh before it was, i brought it back home and uh, i had a big fight with my mother um uh, which probably was incidentally about Ulysses <laughs> when she told me to put it away from when I was older, to read it when I was older, yeah. And Nula, when did you pop your uh, Ulysses cherry? <laughs> um, well, I suppose it's one of those books that when you're interested in Irish writers, you're kind of always reading. And obviously, the sensual joys of Penelope precedes the book, you know, like a big waving banner. And so I had read Penelope over and over and adored it before I read Ulysses from start to finish. And because I was having trouble getting past certain bits of it, I thought the best way to do this is to do it with a group. So I joined up to one of those groups where there's a facilitator and there were 25 of us, some of whom have read the book in depth before. And we would meet once a week and discuss the book. And it was a brilliant way to um, do it because so many people in the group already had knowledge. So you weren't just learning, you weren't just reading the book, you were learning about the book the culture of the book, the history of its publication. So that was a brilliant way into it for me. That's how I came to it as well. Yeah. So you didn't read it in school then? No, I studied Irish in college, not English, so oh. I didn't get to it, yeah. Uh, Paul, do you remember your first experience uh, as a young person with, with Ulysses? You know, I read it, um, or tried to read it as, as a student. Uh, I did not read it as a teenager. <laughs> um, I. I Re tried to read it, I think, is, is the most accurate description when I was at university, which was Queen's University, Belfast. And like many as a one, I think, uh, there was one particular phrase uh, that stopped me in my tracks. Um, it wasn't jeshel, uh, which of course is the uh, is an Irish word, a point at which it does fall under the rubric of Gaelic literature, never mind literature in English. Jeshul meaning going in a good direction, going in the direction of the sun, going clockwise, which is uh, the first word of, of the oxen of the sun chapter. No, it was the sentence, um, ineluctable modality of the visible. Um, and that's a sentence with which I think many people um, stop and, and indeed founder. And when I taught it once, <clears throat> because I did have the chutzpah uh, to teach it once, I actually encouraged my students when they came on that particular chapter to skip it, to go to the next one and just keep on going. <laughs> because I, for, for, I know that's horrendous, that's heretical perhaps, but it, it is a way, but, and then come back to it and then come back to it. Um, because there, there is a sense uh, of being overwhelmed by it, just to go back to the rubric of too much. There is a sense of being overwhelmed by it, which I think actually is very easily overcome. Um, but, um, and it's nothing, nothing compared to Finnegan's Wake, the aforementioned, which I think is actually truly too much. Can I get a show of hands of how many people have read Finnegan's Wake? Oh, wow, not bad. Impressive. So we all have to go home now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's next year's project. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it's hard to judge what reading Finnegan's Wake would mean, yeah. uh, actually. I think, I mean, I, I describe myself as having read it, but what I mean by that is that I took a, I made my way from word to word through it. And I, that is a very particular experience. And I think to reread the same four words um, a, a half an hour later would be a different experience. So I'm not sure if there is such a phenomenon, actually, such a concept as having read Finnegan's Wake, but that's for another day, perhaps. I used to read it before exams. I'd read a page maybe of Finnegan's Wake and, and feel enormously sort of clever. 
Wow. It's like <laughs> spinach, Popeye spinach, but you know, and you go in and you just write, you, you know, so in my finals in, in Trinity, I'd go in and take just, I don't know, a few lines, a half a I was going to say mainlining Finnegan's Way. Yeah, a few lines of it, it makes everything go pop and fizz, you know? Synapses you didn't know you had start to kind of, it, 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 it's, it, it's very galvanizing, I find. Interesting, I have to try it. Um, and I think, you know, Anne, you've said that um, Ulysses is, you know, clearly part of uh, the epigenetics, or Joyce is part of the epigenetics of Irish writers. And I think it's true even outside of Ireland. Um, uh, Rivka Gauchin writes that who's, she does not call herself a big Joyce fan, but still, um, Every attention paid to the quotidian seems to link back to him, as does every highly elusive and densely detailed creation, every lounging in the texture of language, every joke, every game, every difficulty, and every epiphany. Even the video game Minecraft has something Joycean about it. Um, so for each of you, how would you say that Joyce has influenced you, kind of broadly speaking, in terms of the possibilities that he uh, yeah, I think epigenetic is a good choice of word because it's almost like Joyce provided the environment, you know, that altered your progress. So for me, it wasn't uh, a head-to-head, mano-a-mano, person-to-person encounter. I didn't meet the writer and tussle with the writer or love the writer or be a fan of the writer. These, these, this was, it wasn't a dyadic experience. It was being in an environment. I'm not, I'm not saying it very well but it was you know when people confront Joyce that doesn't mean anything to me it's just you read them you read the pages you read the words okay so I, ha I, I say that asking a writer what influence Joyce had is like asking a fish what they think about the water it was just the place where you swam and also in the question of influence there are influences that happen before awareness um, I had no sense of myself as a future writer when I, read, when I started reading in Joyce, and I read, studied portrait when I was 17 and still had no sense of myself that, that this is something I could take and use and be influenced by. So uh, it happened too early for me to be properly anything other than a kind of intervention rather than an influence. But yet you describe the process as kind of similar, I think you call it strenuous dreaming. So reading Joyce is like writing. You find some of the same. It is. It, it, it is. Uh, you sink into some uh, very strange state of flow when you're when when, when you're reading Joyce, uh, making sense and not making sense at the same time, and it it can be very strenuous. And it it's it's uh, the other thing it reminds me of is is deep into an argument when you're really getting close to something, and it can be extremely tiring. That same dreamy fatigue sets in when I read. Um, uh, particularly the the third section, the ineluctable modality of the visible, mm. the Proteus section of Ulysses. Um, it's very close to tiring dreaming. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, Nula, you had written a fictionalized biography before of Emily Dickinson. What was it about Nora's story that you felt needed retelling? Oh, well, I mean, there's Maddox's excellent biography and there's uh, Pat Murphy's excellent film, which brought us up just to their time in Trieste. But I had read Maddox when I was a teenager and loved it. And then I moved to Galway in my mid-20s. And every year I would go to the Bloomsday celebration at the Nora Barnacle House, which is actually our mother's house, little tiny museum now, just a two-room house. Um, <laughs> So I was very aware of her. You know, I had adopted a cat and called her Nora Barnacle. <laughs> She's this lovely, proud, fearsome cat. And I was writing these biographical fictions about Emily Dickinson, as you say, a woman called Belle Bilton, other short stories about Elizabeth Bishop and Frida Kahlo and different people. And it just, it's like this swirl of things happens whereby you end up with a subject to go forward with. So I was studying Italian by night in NUI and you know, I had adopted the cat and I was just thinking about, I had to write an essay actually about their time in Trieste, well, about Joyce's friendship with Italo Svevo, the Italian writer. And all the time I was doing the research, all I could think about was, what did Nora feel about all of this? How did she feel married to this man who adored her, was a genius, was also a drunk, 
um, was irresponsible but loving, was generous but um, nervy around people. What was it like to be married to him? And I suddenly had my next subject. So I wrote a short story first, which sometimes is the way things happen for me. I write something smaller and then realize I'm not finished with this. I'm going to go That's forward. Right. And was delighted to find I was writing a novel because um, that's the next two years sorted in a sense once you begin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I always say, oh shit, I'm writing a novel. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's an element of oh, no. that too. Yeah. Oh no. Because you know you're climbing that mountain. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Paul, your poetry has been described as very elusive and has sort of some of those Joycean qualities. Would you call him a direct influence or more like Anne? Do you think that it was um, a kind of an opening of the spirit? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with <coughs> Anne about, um, about trying to describe his influence <coughs> being somewhat akin to a, a fish describing water. However, I suppose we do have to <laughs> try to be circumspect as fish. What is it about him? <laughs> well, the, the, he is the notion of being of there being too much um, of course is, is um, has been raised i think the great thing about him is despite his impulse his own impulse to go further and further and um, as we know his manuscripts his typescript slash manuscripts are all about um, addition, uh, accrual, accretion, putting more stuff in. Most writers, uh, or at least I suspect many writers, are about cutting back. And of course, his great uh, follower, I suppose, um, Samuel Beckett, um, you know, reacted against him in, 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 in precisely uh, that way of pairing everything back to the bone. Um, but Joyce's impulse is to add. And, um, but what's fascinating about that to me is that as he adds and why he adds and because he adds, he somehow becomes equal to our being here. And um, his, his capacity to render, it render seems a crude word, um, because one's not conscious of him rendering anything, his capacity to give us uh, the world in a slightly altered way. I mean, it's a cliche, but I think it's, it's a truism, but I think it's true. He gives us a world uh, that's recognizable, but, but not quite. Uh, a world that we are seeing as if for the first time. And so he has a marvelous capacity to, to rinse his own eye and our own. And I, and I think that actually is something that many writers um, learn from. And in a strange way, um, one would expect those of us who are primarily interested in writing verse um, to look more to um, W.B. Yeats, say, in the Irish context. But <clears throat> I think on balance, while I do look to Yeats, I find myself looking even more to Joyce. Because um, when it comes to Yeats, I have, I have a sense in my innocence or perhaps arrogance of how it's done. I actually have a pretty good sense of how Yeats did it from case to case. I find it much more difficult uh, to figure out how Joyce did it, much more mysterious, much more elusive, um, and, and much more interesting, actually. But is it a, sorry, is it a particular thing that he did? Because he did so many different things, you know? It's almost well, like you could figure out Dubliners, but, it, but the, where you find the problem, maybe where your problem is. Well, you know, to figure out Dubliners would be, would in itself be a major achievement. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about Dubliners is that it seems, for the most part, if we may think of it as a single piece, which is not, there's shifts in tone and style in it, but it's somewhat consistent. I mean, <clears throat> um, as we were hear, hearing earlier on, um, 
I had the, the, the privilege, um, the task of trying to um, render the dead as, a, as a, an immersive piece, a piece of immersive theater. And one of the things that I, I discovered, if I didn't already know it, was just how, despite its apparent um, immediacy, its, its huge complexity and how virtually every word in it resonates um, in a way actually that's perhaps not so obvious as it might be with Finnegan's Wake or Ulysses, but actually resonates too. So um, I, I think what I'm interested in is his capacity to be available um, and to be doing more than one thing at a time. Now, there's no, there's no particular um, desirability in that, but it just happens to be something I'm interested in myself. And so I, I look to him for that, among other things. Thank you. Um, and you wrote earlier this year about um, Joyce's influence, that it was liberating for women, but uh, a burden for men. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more yeah, about that. That's just a kind of social observation over the years when I hear one or other writer say that it's hard to write in the shadow of choice. And I, I began to realize that, that they were usually men who are saying this. Um, and also in response to questions about influence, as though, which seemed unmonitory or slightly authoritarian, how dare you be influenced by somebody as great as, you know, um, I, 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 that seemed to posit a kind of inheritance. And Ireland is terrible at doing that. I mean, that, that uh, who, who's, in, who, who's wearing the mantle is, is, is a big Irish question, you know. Um, um, and I rather thought you could do what you liked with or despite choice. Um, um, and then I realized after the fact that people like Edna O'Brien, Nuala, uh, many, uh, Emer McBride, uh, uh, really took their kind of courage from, 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 from Joyce's work. Not just, not just because he talked about sex, but because of the way, the way he worked language was so kind of profoundly anti-patriarchal, I think, in Ulysses in particular. Um, and that by liberating the sentence, by, by, by uh, you know, the libidinal rush of his, uh, of Penelope, for example, the absence of punctuation or whatever, by going under the skin uh, with Bloom and others, that that was all facilitatory for women's fiction. For a while, I said that woman that Joyce was a woman. He, he, you know, he wrote domestic fiction in which nothing much happened. There were relationships, and uh, and the de and it was full of small details, um, just like women did. Um, and he was interested in the insides of people's heads, right. even when it wasn't all that dramatic. Um, so yes, I mean, he 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 just he he has just been a force for for great, you know, his presence has, has facilitated great work, I think, since then. It's interesting you say that about women's fiction because Virginia Woolf had said that um, as well, that women would have to kind of explode the narrative structure of the Victorian novel in order to write. Um, yeah, and it, it begs those questions of what happens when you put a sentence together? What are, you, what are you limiting? What are you putting together? What are you fixing there on the page? And by the, f the way he unfixed everything and unloosed everything, it, will, it, 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 it is very empowering for yeah. both the reader, I think, um, and subsequent writers. Sure, with yeah. much more of a focus on words rather than sentences. Would you say? Yeah, he rocks yeah. a good sentence, but yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and Nuala, I know one of your inspirations was the letters, which uh, you wrote about for the Paris Review. And quite interestingly, you know, of course, we don't have Nora's side of the, the lewd letters, the filthy letters, I think you called them. Um, and there, the, his Joyce's side is still under copyright, so you had to use your imagination for what that would have been like. Um, do you think that there is no Joyce without Nora? Is, is she a muse so much that he wouldn't have been able to write kind of the the sex scenes that he did, for example, without her in his life. Yeah, and not so much even the mutes, even though he did pick her brains and her stories and use them in the work famously, but 
you know, writers have to be facilitated, and Nora was a great facilitator. She looked after his health and his home life in order that he could write. So she did used to drag him home from bistros at night or send other people out to drag him home so that he could write because he was teaching English by day a lot of the time um, and had the care of the family in that way. But if he, didn't, if he drank too much, he didn't have time to write and she needed to make sure that he would have that time. Uh, to go back to the influence thing, Anne and I are both from Dublin and Joyce's language is our language. And that language hadn't changed or evolved much by the time it came around to us to write and be writers. But when you read someone like Joyce as a dub and you hear your own language on the page, it just seems very natural and a very normal thing to you. And the stories are very recognisable as well. Like it's astonishing really when you think about Dubliners that he wrote these in his late teens, early 20s and how deep they are and how pinpoint accurate they are on the Irish psyche, if there is such a thing. Um, all the sorrow and the shame that he puts in those books. But that was because there were things he knew. He was, Joyce wrote a lot about, really about poverty and money and class. And all of that comes out in the stories. That's what all of those stories are about. They're about levels and levels. And I think only someone who has known genuine poverty and the shame of the father basically drinking away all of their money and moving them by night with bailiffs at the door you know, doing these midnight flits where they had to take every, every little thing they owned and move as a family, and how angry the Joyce children were with their father about this, and all of that comes out in the work. So I think it was a very, still to us, I was born in 1970, you know, still to us it was a very recognisable Dublin, I suppose, and it feels like you're reading about people that you know, and I think that can be useful. Like when I would read uh, Brendan Behan as well, I found the same thing as a teenager, you know, that here's my language, here's my people, I know where I am with these people. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the thing about influence being there, but yet not being there, it's just, it's sort of a natural part of your reading. You know, you, you're just absorbing it in and realising by that, I'm allowed to write this stuff. I'm allowed to write about anything, the body, the mind, whatever, you know, ordinary life. And do you think for the young writers kind of just coming, uh, coming up now, do you think it's still recognizable, Dublin, or have we moved too far away from the... No, I mean... Very cosmo. Uh, yeah, no, but the language is... It, 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 the language, they're like, it's like an artifact in the book. It's like a found object, some of those, those sentences, you know? I mean, you can literally hear it as you walk around the streets or if you're, you know, move, move up in the bed, says... Buck Mulligan, and he's getting into the sea uh, at the 40 foot. And, you know, that's what Irish men say. They say it in the bar, they say it in traffic, move up there in the bed. Um, and <laughs> I never noticed it until I was reading it. And I thought, oh, yeah, God, that's exactly, it. you know, you just reclaim these, these sentences. Also, that kind of mock heroic, uh, um, the, the kind of fecky yeah way of talking, <laughs> the sort of posturing. That, that the, the men particularly in Ulysses yeah. do, that's still very current and pretty accurate to a certain style, a certain social style that we still. And have. he drew from, his father was from Cork, he drew from him a lot, and he drew from Nora, who was from Galway. So he's this lovely amalgam of Irish phrases going through the thing that sound very natural to an Irish ear. It's funny, when you read it with a group and some of the people are not Irish, they don't always get you know, the phrases like that, like move up in the bed and stuff, whereas mm. to Irish people, they sound very natural. And that's, that's another beauty of reading Ulysses and Joyce in general, that you sort of have an extra in as an Irish person because it's the language of your people, in a sense. Yeah. Sure. Um, and Paul, yesterday we were talking about, uh, there was a panel on kind of contemporary Ireland and how much more diverse it is. And interestingly, Emily Pine was saying how, you know, in the past decade with gay rights, abortion rights, there's been kind of a flowering of, um, you know, progressive thought or just a recognition of what the population thought. Um, sitting as you are from the States, having watched the, you know, terribly fast decline of same um, progressiveness, how do you kind of feel about, you know, you've been abroad from, since 1987. How, what's your relationship to, to Dublin and the language of Dublin? Uh, well, sorry, there's several things happening there. Let me see. Let, let's sorry. First of all, let's, <laughs> okay, let's take Dublin. 
you know, <clears throat> one of the things about uh, Joyce's Dublin uh, and the contemporary Dublin is that actually, I, I, in many ways, not much has changed, certainly around the city centre, and that one can still steer um, through the, the city uh, using um, Ulysses as, as a Baedeker, as a, as a, as a guide. And, um, you know, and there are moments, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is looking up <clears throat> on from um, um, Nassau Street, is it? And, uh, <clears throat> and seeing uh, Wynn's Hotel. Um, it's not Nassau Street. What what is it? Finn's Hotel. Finn's Hotel and Nassau Street. Finn's yeah. Hotel, like looking down Nassau it Street, down the lake. Nassau. Lincoln, I, yeah. I always hesitate. I always hesitate about Nassau because I, I live at work in Princeton, and we have our own Nassau named you after the same fellow, you... Prince William. <laughs> Orange and Nassau. So actually, um, so you know, and 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 he was so as you know, he was such a stickler for detail, for accuracy, writing to, was it one of his aunts? Aunt Josephine, um, yeah. Aunt Josephine about, uh, you know, getting the details right as to whether or not an able-bodied man, quote unquote, would be able to leap over the railings and down into the area at 7 Echo Street or whatever it was. Well, I mean, for most of us, accuracy is a great thing, but at the end of the day, really, uh, you know, who, who cares about that kind of detail? And that, it's for that reason, among others, um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the fidelity to the, the fabric of the streets, um, that, that the specificity of that, that, that he continues to, uh, to, to, be, to give us a Dublin that's recognisable, in addition to which, of course, the, the, on, the continuing recognition our recognition of the characters um, who are there, and um, you know, we're we're we we do recognise ourselves um, in those characters. Vis a vis the changes in Ireland, um, those have been huge. Needless to say, the Ireland that I left in 1987 was, um, I think, it would be fair to say, a somewhat benighted place. And we were just coming out of, uh, you know, the Car the Carrie Babies case, for example. Um, the church still had, to, pardon my French, a stranglehold on the place, um, and um, that has changed so dramatically. And um, <clears throat> Ireland is now one of the most progressive countries in the world, and one of the most far-seeing countries in the world and it's absolutely thrilling to see what has happened there and um, so and I think Joyce would be thrilled to see what has happened there in terms of diversity uh, in every in every uh, respect uh, I mean I think that's what one of the things he was trying to do in 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 Ulysses was to was to offer an Ireland that was um, a little unlikely, actually, in its diversity, in choosing uh, the, the main character Leopold Bloom as the as as his Irishman, uh, an unlikely Irishman in some ways. But in any case, um, so but I can see you're asking me to comment on the state of America. <laughs> um, no, I suppose. How much time do you, that was? I think the third component of the question. <laughs> that was sub point eighteen uh, k. Okay. Um, no, I suppose. I suppose what I meant was um, because Joyce was writing about Dublin from a place of exile as well, and yet you know got it so right. And you've been gone for such a. Um, important chunk of, of Irish history. And I mean, I'm myself stunned. Um, Can I make a small suggestion that Joyce wrote before Ireland closed down to the extent it did. He wrote at yes. a time of hopefulness mm. and of, you know, when mixtures and varieties were still possible before we turned into a kind of uh, Catholic state. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, when, yes, maybe, yes, and yes, yes, and no, says Paul. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, you know, the, he, he continued to, uh, I mean, one of, one of the nets by which he needed to fly uh, was, was the Catholic Church. So he was, he had that sort of thought. Um, and uh, I, I would, I, I think that Joyce would be thrilled, as so many of us are, to see the Catholic Church on the run, as it should properly be. In fact, they should be drummed out of the country. Yeah, that's anyway. on a slow trot. <laughs> at, a fast pace, at a fast pace. In any case. Terrific, thank you. Um, Sorry, that was a conversation stopper. My apologies. <laughs> Um, so to play devil's advocate, uh, I think everybody on the stage here would agree that you cannot have too much choice. However, um, since it's our topic today and as we're kind of straggling towards the end of the, the centenary year, um, Martin Doyle, the Irish Times, said to me, as, as much as he appreciates the influence, continuing influence of Joyce, um, he would forego the opportunity to, to cover yet another Bloomsday in order to highlight a neglected writer such as Maeve Brennan. Um, and Anne, you've written a lot about kind of neglected writers, including Maeve, uh, in your laureate writings. Um, do you think that that holds water? By talking about Joyce, is there some way... Well, there's a difference between the book and what we do at the, with the book, right. you know? So I, I, I suffered Bloomsdays when I was uh, younger and thought it was all a, a great nonsense. And I felt like a, a real slightly horrible mouse in Disneyland looking out at the parade with Mickey Mouse being paraded <laughs> down. I, I was say, no, I'm a writer. <laughs> what you're doing here isn't, you know, is something much more plastic or whatever. So, uh, but I mean, as I grow older and I s visit more places and I realize we celebrate something, um, and my youthful contempt was really badly misplaced. Uh, to look at everybody in their hats and their long dresses and, and, and their boaters and all the rest of it and think that they hadn't read the book, which is, in fact, not the case. I mean, everybody's very famously not, not able to finish. Not finishing Ulysses is a great subject of conversation, but actually so many <laughs> people really have finished Ulysses and many here have finished Finnegan's Wake. I mean, it can't be, it can't be gainsaid. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a uniquely sort of great bit of our, our streetscape now. So I, I go and eat kidneys with the best of them. Excellent. And I think it, raise, it raises all boats, doesn't it? I mean, I think the reveling in Joyce actually, um, I, mean, I, I would I like to think that, that that helps everyone, including those of us who are still knocking around and that, you know, that something of that engagement with Joyce might one day, um, you know, carry over to to a little a little engagement at least with with other writers, and I'm I'm pretty sure it does. And um, so, I mean, I, I, a country in which there is such um, regard for at least that writer is 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 a, a country with which I, I'm proud to be associated. I have to say. But also sometimes when I'm teaching younger people now um, in UCD, and there, there is a kind of impulse to close texts down, okay? And I have to remind them that they are studying at the university that produced James Joyce. And that is not just a kind of asking them to up their game. It's also saying everything is allowed and this space must be kept free and open. And to, and to close it down in some way would, would, would be to do your own talent at a service, you know? I think as well that there is a greater conversation now about how books are made and how Ulysses was made with the aid of, you know, four very strong women, well, five, Beach, Weaver, Anderson Heap, and Nora. And that without those five women, Ulysses wouldn't exist because they were the people who supported him, paid for his lifestyle, and ultimately published the book at great risk you know, a special edition weighing three and a half pounds, 760 pages, an absolutely bonkers project for Sylvia Beach to take on. But she liked Joyce so much as a person, she did take it on. Why did the ladies like him so much? I don't know. <laughs> he was very sort of um, introverted and 
clammy handshake and sort of quiet, and maybe they just wanted to mother him. He definitely wanted Nora to mother him. He said it. He said, I want to climb into your womb, you know? That's how much he needed and wanted her care. Um, but he was quite exploitative, wasn't he, really, as well? Oh, he was. He was an awful user, like. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> he had a certain type of personality, but I think we concentrate a lot on Joyce's, the negative aspects of Joyce, and I love to celebrate the the good aspects of him too, you know? And, and also these five women who, without whom it, it was never going to exist. Thanks. Um, and, and so you, you teach you this is still? No, I just, uh, no, uh, that's my creative writing students. Okay. So I wouldn't dream of teaching Ulysses. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, because we were talking in the green room about whether or not one can look at it with a contemporary gaze. Um, and you were saying that you think it stands up to you know, for yeah, example. I mean, I really do. I, I, I have been reading it every five or ten years. I had a gap there of maybe 20 years. I came back to it after 20 years to read it again last in preparation for the centenary. Um, and it just gives and gives. It, it, Ulysses just is an absolutely endlessly generous book. It gives you your city back fresh and new each time. It gives you the map uh, again uh, and again. Um, and it is the kind of book that I read as a measure of my own growth, you know? So it's a kind of more relationship than a book yeah. for me at this stage. And how, what would you say has evolved in terms of your own reading of it? Was, are you more sympathetic or? Actually, yeah, when I read it as a student, I, did, I didn't you know, use guidebooks and all the rest of it, so I read it kind of properly this time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, looking it up and, you know, doing it properly. Um, I, I didn't think Ulysses wanted me to read it properly before, but I thought... Mm. <laughs> um, and I was very interested in the figures of the women and in the elements of fantasy in the Penelope section and elements of projection in the Gertie McDowell section. But um, I was also, as, as Nuala points out, this time around I was really interested in the money. Uh, because when you read as a young person, you don't think money matters, but later you see all the ex all the debt, the debts, and the and the small, de you know, and, and, and the figure of the, the father, standing of the, the starving girls, and the starving yeah. girls, oh, yeah. and everything, and the money and the shame of the, the of that poverty is really striking. Yeah. Uh, Paul, have you read it recently? Have you gone back to it? Do you go back to it regularly? Yes, I did actually. I read it last a couple a couple of years ago. I do I do go back to it regularly. And I mean, I think we don't have to choose, of course, but I think it's probably my single, yeah, I think it's my single fav favorite book. And wow. uh, yeah, I mean, all, <laughs> I mean, this has been touched on before uh, already, <clears throat> but you know, all human life is there. Which, what was it, the news of the world that they used to say that about? Or one of those <laughs> English newspapers? You remember? Yes. Was it the news of the world? Yeah, sure. All human life is the there. The audience says yes. <laughs> you know, it's a while ago. I, I, I don't even know if the news of the world exists anymore. But Freddie, sorry, my <laughs> hamster. Um, <laughs> so we've been celebrating the book for the centenary, but um, you guys write short stories, and, and of course you wrote the introduction to the anthology of Irish short stories. Um, and Paul, you have described the dead as, I think, the, the greatest short story ever written. And, and also, everything is there. So, you know, in terms of accrual, although it's a long short story, it's kind of novella size, it's still much shorter, of course, than Ulysses. Um, what do you think is, do we still see in terms of his, what did he offer the short story? It's, it's, it's really hard for me to answer that because um, when I, as Nuala said, reading those uh, stories, it was, I read Evelyn when uh, I was in my teens, and to me it was, I, I, did, I thought it was a piece of contemporary <laughs> fiction. I just hadn't, I just didn't put it back in the day. It was so like the lives of my aunts mm. in, in Redbrook, Fib Fibsborough. Um, and now, uh, I, I can't read The Dead without crying. It's one of the only things that makes me, me cry yeah. every time. So uh, I read The Dead in order to have a little weep. So that is beyond criticism, isn't it? That's a completely useless thing to say to an audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's just no good at all. Um, or I watch the 
film, uh, the, the John Houston film of the dead with my mother, and she's, those are all the actors, and she says, they're all dead now. <laughs> and we watch, yes, and they know I'm nearly all dead. It's just beautiful, beautiful work. No, and it, it's very modern, as you say, it doesn't... Yeah, I, I can't even say. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, um, it's just too close to my heart, actually, yeah. Yeah. clearly. Um, yeah. How about you, Paul, having I adapted it, it? Well, first of all, I, I remember when I read um, Dubliners first, which again would have been probably at university, I think. Um, I couldn't quite understand because I, I really didn't have a sense of the history of the short story in English. Um, and I couldn't quite understand what, what, why these stories seem so groundbreaking, so revolutionary, so unlike anything else. Um, and I mean, the, of course, he's, he, is, um, he is drawing on, on other uh, sources, but it's, um, and one has a sense that he, he, he might be influenced by who, Ibsen, Maupassant, whoever. Um, um, and it's still hard to figure out what, what, was, what is so revolutionary about them in their, their ordinariness. Um, you know, their, their, their seeming lack of concern um, for regard for plot, for example, though there's plenty going on, you know, stories in which in many ways not, not all that much happens. Um, and um, so it, it's, it, it, there is something quite mysterious about them even now to me. I, I don't know if I can really answer that question that I had 50 years ago, you know? which is kind of pathetic, really. <laughs> yeah. Or magical, yeah. He uh, was writing The Dead in 1906, 1907, when they were living in Rome. He was working in a bank. And I put a scene into my novel where he and Nora are quite hungry because they were, they just had pasta for dinner that Christmas day. And so The Dead has one of the most beautiful <laughs> food <laughs> scenes <laughs> in all of Irish literature, all of literature, never mind Irish literature. And so I have them hungry and deciding what the ants would have had on the table, the two right. sisters, the Morkins. And so they're thinking of all this lovely food. And, you know, it was such a joy to write because it is one of my favorite stories too. And just to draw on what I know of the story and, and make a, a sort of a believable scene about it. Yeah. Fascinating. He wanted to write about Irish hospitality. He realized the book didn't contain a story about hospitality. And so this was it. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Um, so just before I uh, take it to audience questions, um, and in, in that introduction to the anthology of short stories, you mentioned the oral tradition. And you've also said that, y Ulysses, you don't have to read the whole thing, but if you want to enjoy it in bits, that you recommend listening. Um, ah, yeah. And, and I still say that at every Joyce event, which this will be the last, I think, because it's a dinner. Because <laughs> there's too much done. choice, yeah. But there is, uh, Click Away is the 1982 RTE Players uh, recording. And if you, get, you, if you get jammed up in Joyce, which you can, you can you, you, sometimes your brain seizes up and judders to a halt and you close the book. If you want a paced uh, companion, mm. um, then, the audio is a, is, is, a, is a wonderful way to go. And, and it's the 1982 RTE players. Um, so listen as you read. And, and it actually takes, rinses out some of the uh, thrill of not knowing what's happening because you, it, 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 it grounds it that little bit more. You say, oh, oh okay, that's just going on the chamber pot, okay. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's, it's not as alarming as yeah. we thought, you know, or whatever. Mm. Yeah. It's not as, yeah. yeah. So, so if you're interested in finding out what the actions are behind, behind the work, then that's a very nice, pacey way of doing it. Exactly, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. I listen to it for comfort. It's like a comfort listen. Wow. Because um, the actors love it. I mean, it's the theatricality and the, I mean, the, 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 they loved reading it. Yeah. Um, and again, 
none of these actors had PhDs. They, they, it really shows you how in the grain of, of ordinary life the book is that an actor can seize on that kind of uh, um, and, and, and make great play with it um, and be revelatory in, in their reading of it. Mm. So we think of it as somehow inaccessible because there's so much of it. But actually, if you take it gently as it goes, it, um, it, it does it does what it's it's not it's not formidable at all. And, and Paul, did you find the same with your actors? Were they? I, I, I did actually, and uh, just to go back to that RTE production, which is extraordinary. You know, it, it, we're, we're used to thinking that uh, Finnegan's Wake might best, might most usefully be thought of as an, an oral mm. or oral experience. But I, I do think the same is true um, of. Um, of Ulysses and possibly, possibly even the stories in Dubliners, including the dead, um, because when it's on its feet, as they say, and when one actually, um, you know, sees um, and, and in a, a representation of the party or the meal, or the speech at the meal, it does somehow, um, it, it's, it is most itself, I think, somehow. Um, yeah, so uh, the the orality, the orality, the ear as as much as the eye, or perhaps even more. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, are there any questions in the audience? We've got mics. There's one here. Hello. I think all four of you have talked about the familiarity, in some sense, of Ulysses in relation to Dublin. In other words, you can use it as an A to Z, you can recognize the phraseology. Does that mean for us poor people who were not brought up in Dublin and haven't and lived the other side, that we are actually missing more than your average Irish reader might be? Or you're being given more. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, possibly that too. But if you have the time to figure it out, I suppose. Well, I'll there's well, probably nuance in it that might go past you. But I mean, there's a lot that might go past you in Ulysses. Um, yes, no, except I, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. We can figure out what move over in the bed or move up in the bed means. I mean, we go towards it, and also. Um, I'm reminded of uh, that poem by W.H. Auden. It's a, a series of poems called Shorts, and one of them has to do with um, a valley cheese, as he describes it, a cheese from some, um, what, a valley on the, in France or Switzerland that, you know, is absolutely redolent of its terroir, as we say, in Ireland nowadays, um, <laughs> the, place, the, the specificity of its place, you know, the move up and the badness of it, mm. um, and it, it, it's precisely for the combination of water, grass, whatever, limestone, that has gone uh, through, that has been, you know, gone through a cow or a sheep or whatever it is to make that cheese. Uh, that allows it to be prized beyond its valley. And the same, I think some version of that is true of Ulysses also. You know, we, we may have some inside track along the, here and there, but the truth is that, um, uh, you know, it's a little bit like David Lean's film of Ryan's Daughter, where someone complained about the fact that Robert Mitchum, was it, would never really sound like an Irishman or be accepted as an Irishman to which to, you know to which the, the feeling was well actually who cares the Irish um, film going audience however large it might be is a tiny percentage of the worldwide uh, uh, film f cinema going audience and nobody's going to care and I think in a strange way the same is true of Ulysses, and, and that's why it is prized, not only locally, but right around the world, far from the valley in which it was 
made. What a wonderful analogy, the cheese. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, as an American, I will speak oh, to you. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, I just say it's Auden's analogy. Yeah. It's not my W.H. No, Auden. Yeah, wonderful. yeah. Yeah, it worked. Um, I just wanted to, as an American reading Ulysses, I can highly recommend being one of the annoying tourists that Anne um, was disdainful of in her Actually, youth. Actually, it was the Irish I was disdainful of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have been to Bloomsday, and there is really something about walking the streets and seeing you know, the Martello Tower and you know, swimming in, 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 um, in Sandy Cove. And so I think um, you know, if you can get there, it's, 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 it's a really nice thing to do to kind of ground the book in the terroir. Or just come to Dublin and take the train along Sandy Mount Strand and look out to the horizon there and you understand everything mm. about Proteus. Great. Okay, more questions? Got one here in the front row? Mm. Yeah. 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 Sorry, no, we've got one here. The mic's coming. Mm. Thank you. I mean, that was, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Uh, I don't really want to stab anyone in the eye, but I find Dublin kind of alien. I've read Joyce a number of times, but the, my people to go to are Seamus Heaney and Paul, because I'm from the north. And I come from a very Catholic minority area of a Protestant county, and we have sort of a different cultural uh, heritage. And in my view, Dublin is foreign. I like Joyce, I love Joyce, but... Get a passport. I don't... <laughs> I'm going to have to, to travel in Europe now. Yes, you're right. But it's just a point that I don't feel that uh, kindred spirit with Joyce about Dublin, though I love Joyce's writing, and I've been to Dublin a number of times. It's just, it is, a, it is another place. It is not somewhere that I am familiar with. It's really interesting, this idea of familiarity, because Joyce is full of people being over-familiar. Um, yes. But also, the book is, is some, uh, Ulysses is, is something that one is invited to experience from the inside, as it were. Um, so what we're talking about, externality and inter internality, really matters in a way. Can you experience the book, even if you're not from Dublin, from the inside, rather than as an external object? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So uh, yeah. it is, it's, it, it's an invitation to be a Dubliner, is the book. Oh, the, yes, the, and, 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 and a welcome. And, and you're all very welcome, <laughs> no matter where you're from. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, Ireland is a <clears throat> resolutely regional country. You know, from village to village, we look at the other side as foreigners, you know, that kind of way. And we're proud of who we have locally. And it's wonderful that you're proud of Heaney and Joyce. We are too. We love them too. But, you know, Cork is proud of, or Galway is proud of O'Flaherty and whoever, you know what I mean? And we have them all. Ulysses just looms so large, I suppose. I do think that um, you can take it on as a project and fall in love with it. But it's not going to be for everybody either, you know? No, I think that is true, but I think it is in danger of overwhelming... Eclipsing, everything. yes. I don't know, that's kind of Joyce's killing everything argument it, really, no, no. or overshadowing or, and that's the argument that uh, I heard from the male writers in particular, that Joyce was a shadow. I just, I, I think you just have to throw that off as an idea of, of, of Joyce taking anything or invading anything or, you know, it, it, just, it just exists. It's like complaining about trees or something. Mm. But I think it's also like a tourism thing. He's used as a symbol of Irish literature and yet he's long dead, etc., etc. Yeah, we should just all read what we want and love what we want. And <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to that. And we, we do revere Heaney in Dublin as well, I have to say, you know. And Paul. And, of course, and Paul, Paul. Of course. Paul's our pal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he'll be on the banknote next. <laughs> well, is that one of that's one of the hilarious things about all this, really, isn't it? That you know, he he barely. Did, how, how often did he go back? He went back a couple of times in his yeah. life in his lifetime, and mm. I mean, whatever the opposite of revered was, that was Joyce in Dublin. Yep. And uh, so it is kind of it's somewhat amusing, and I'm obviously not the first person to comment on this to see the 
the Reverend's forum now, and yes. I'm sure he would be highly amused by it. And, and sometimes when he is revered, it's good to point out some of the content of the book. Um, <laughs> uh, just to sort that out a little again, you know, just to, but just to say that he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't writing a book that would be, that had reverence in mind. Mm. He was a very irreverent yeah. writer. Okay. Yes. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. I'm me. afraid we're out of time. And thanks to everybody for tuning in uh, in person and uh, online. It's been wonderful. And, you know, um, hopefully we'll, Joyce will continue to roll on in the background, whether we read him or not. <laughs> and uh, I think we're all grateful for, for his contribution to Irish literature. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much.